This is Matt Bacon. Howdy. And this is Jesse Cannon. Okay, who wants to break the ice? Who wants to do a first question? What is your best advice for networking and mingling at an event like this? For those who are shy, maybe don't know if they want to talk to people. By the way, my name is Elijah. Nice to meet you all. Everybody coming who came from far or close, thank you for coming. First off, thank you for asking the perfect first question. That was like basically a layup for both of us. Matt? I think the, the key thing to me is always like just listen. Like always just like ask people thoughtful questions and then go, okay, and then just ask follow-ups. And I think like everyone likes talking about themselves and you can get people comfortable by asking them questions, you know? So that's always been my advice is like, if you don't know what to do, just be like, yo, that's a really cool Star Wars pin. And then go from there and then figure out if they like real Star Wars or bad Star Wars, you know? I'm gonna be a little lighthearted here and say, you know, I've lived in this city since the 90s, because I'm old as shit, and uh, I see the same people on the streets all the time. You know what I've never done of the thousand people I've met? That person came up to me and asked me if I liked the same thing as them, but I thought they were a fucking idiot. <laughs> now, it does help them a little face blind, but what I do remember, just the other day, walking down the street with my dog, I see somebody that I used to talk to at Golden Years where we had our last thing. I haven't been there in a little while. I run into them. We have a lovely conversation. I listen to a record they recommended. Been listening to it all week. That's the beauty of actually trying and going up to someone. Whereas no one says, I can't believe they talked to me about that Earthquaker device's fucking pedal. No one ever says that. No, I think that's very accurate. Like, I definitely think, especially in genres of music where people, like, wear a lot of band shirts. I don't know. That's a great groundbreaker, though, is to be like, yo, you like American football? Me too. Let's bond about being sad. <laughs> I, I, I think there's even a, another thing of um, there's really easy questions sometimes to ask because you know what everybody likes talking about the thing that the, especially in this type of crowd the shit that you are way into that no one else knows about it one of the best things is like what have you been just so obsessed with lately what, swans <laughs> like, there, there you go I'm really obsessed with the boys noise uh, Rico Dasty record happy to talk someone's ear off listen to Switched On Pops episode about it this week, I know way too much. Great question. Who would like to go next? So, uh, streaming and digital presence in music is obviously something that's very important, but um, I think that everybody here knows somebody who has a lot of followers and a lot of streams but can't get people to come out to their shows. So, there's a funny thing where we over-prioritize digital and then we under-prioritize or don't know how to go out to the real world and, um, and network, kind of like what you guys are talking about, which I think is really important. Can you kind of give some advice to people about, or, or share your thoughts about how to sort of balance the two things, the digital world and the in-person world, reality, you know what I'm saying? I love it. So this is something I've been thinking about a lot. Uh, I manage a band called Autumn Kings who, you know, they have like 300,000 Spotify monthlies you know, they're number 38 on alt-rock radio right now, but they're not like a touring band who sell merch, right? And then meanwhile, I manage a band that has, you know, a sixth of that and pull 300 people everywhere they go. Okay, interesting. The way I kind of view it, and I'd be curious for Jesse's thoughts, I always view it as kind of a two-pronged attack, right? Which is to say, yeah, the digital stuff is really important, but I think that if your project is not a project in the world that people can engage with, people don't treat it as a real product, if that makes sense. People have to have a sense that like, oh, this exists before they start actually buying it because otherwise it just feels like a brand that makes music rather than sort of an artist as such, if that makes sense. And so I think you kind of have to do both sides, right? Because simultaneously, you know, people do need to know the name and, peop and having that streaming income Real goddamn valuable, right? So I've always viewed it as a two-pronged approach, realizing that like the community building is really important. And if you do happen to like have the really good songs that like get you on Spotify radio and make you thousands of dollars a month forever, that's kind of the other side, if that makes sense. I think it's a really funny thing because one of the trends tonight will be as I'm sure I'm gonna disparage a lot of label people I have meetings with and the stupid things they say. So I'll hear this thing all the time. Well, you guys are a streaming band. And I'm like, what the fuck does that mean? Now, what I do, because someone's paying my check, is I stay silent while I think that to myself. <laughs> but 
I don't think that anybody is particularly a streaming band or a live band or whatever. I mean, it's one thing if you don't concentrate on that, but one of the things I think about all the time is if you want to be something more, all you have to do is create a culture around it. So a good example, one of my bigger clients. So we did a lot of social media of what are you wearing to this tour? You know, what are you creating the culture of when you come out to this thing, this is a safe space for this. Probably in the majority of the people I work with most in depth are queer artists. And a lot of it is one, how are we making people feel safe? So we want everybody to feel like they're, we're gonna be in a good, nurturing, loving community where we care for each other. Giving signals to whatever your culture is will one, bolster everything because then people talk about it and say, wow, they were actually really cool about creating a culture around this. And then two, uh, thinking about how you show what has then happened. So like one of my favorite, um, things right now is just like bands documenting, like has anybody watched the YouTube channel uh, Neopunk FM? Yeah. Okay, one, if you all haven't watched this, one of the greatest channels I can think of because they document the culture of fans. Bands should be documenting their culture. They should be going out, literally showing who's at their shows, talking to their fans, and showing who belongs there and that you belong there because let's be honest, just as the first question was about insecurity, we don't always all know what to do. We're all awkward. I'm fucking 46 years old, I'm still awkward at times. Show people it's safe. And I think that's a really crucial point, is like, if you're trying to establish it as a live thing, right, you need to showcase people, hey, the live show exists and it's really fucking sick. And if you come, you will have a really fun time partying or, oh, it'll be like this really beautiful emotional experience and you'll cry or whatever. But you need to like document that because if it doesn't, present as something that exists in the world, and if it doesn't present as like, oh hey, this is important and meaningful and like something where you can go and experience it, then nobody's gonna know, right? It's like I always talk about like, bands who post shitty, shitty cell phone shots and then wonder why no one takes them seriously. You know, like, you could have no one at your show, but if you have a good photographer, like you can look like a rock star and make that show look cool as hell, right? And then like, if it looks cool as hell, then people are gonna go, oh, that's cool, I should go to that, right? And I think like, Documenting that in any way you can is really crucial to getting people to come out. Like, and this is like 40% of why the hardcore scene is having this resurgence is that there's like eight photographers at every show. Is like, I mean, it's like that and like 856. Yeah, like, no, but 856 is the same thing. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, if you don't know what 856 is, like, that's just the guy who films shows. I don't know, man. Like, it helps the culture look really fucking exciting. And so people go. How do you make the culture around your band or your, your live music look very exciting? Did you just have to find ways to document that? I kind of wanted to build off the, what you just were talking about. I know in the last couple of years, a lot of solo artists have emerged because we were stuck at home for a long time and we just started writing our own music. And, um, so how, if you're in a situation like that and you can't really replicate what you do on the record, in a live situation, how do you how do you manage that? I mean, I just say like use backing tracks. Fuck it. My my point was gonna be this: is that we are actually in an era where there's always gonna be somebody who says something. Some fucking incel loser will be like, "Oh, the backing tracks are terrible." <laughs> but the real thing is, is one of the things we have to acknowledge on just a. If we go to science, I, I'm one of the few people who read scientific papers on musicians, on music all day. At a baseline level, the loudness of live music when they test it neurologically is like 90% that you're just hearing a song louder than you ever heard before that you already liked it. And so it does not matter for most people if there's a fucking backtrack. Now, secondly, we have all these things now that have never been precedented for what you can do. You can have amazing visuals that are pretty easy to make. There's tons of kids who, I talk to kids every day who are musicians who are consoling, they're like, I just want to make graphics for people on stage. I'm like, get on fucking TikTok and tell people that. You'll get hired in five minutes. Everyone wants that. And it's also really easy. I mess with AI generation things all the time. If you look at most people's live shows, it's a repetition of a loop. You get a few loops and you do it. People will feel it way more or get creative and I don't know, do a little puppet show in the background. Get your friend that's weird down the block. That Thanks. This is, this is what it's like every time Jesse and I hang out. Basically, I agree with Jesse. I think that like every artist you like who has a band, I would say 95% of them 
are using some level of tracks, even like the big artists who are playing Madison Square Garden who have like 12 people on stage, like there's still some sort of track going on pretty much constantly for whatever reason, right? Because, oh, this bit has an orchestra or because whatever, right? And I think that it's, especially if you're living like a punk and DIY space, you know, it's very easy to be like, oh, well, you can't fucking have a track when you play the pariah. Like, I played the pariah, we had a track, it was okay. Um, okay. I mean, it, it was the pariah, like, we were doing a lot of horrible drugs. But like, but, like, you know what I'm saying, like, people know it's fine. Like, it's much better to be out there doing something than to be, like, sitting in your room going, like, well, maybe one day I'll find a bassist. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know, like, I fucking, I work with that band in Jested. They just, they did, like, their, all their first U.S., or their last couple U.S. tours without a bassist. Because, like, they just couldn't get it together for a variety of reasons, which is fine. And it still fucking worked. And they still, like, went and got to go on tour with Lorna Shore. Like, I don't know, man. As long as the show is good, nobody's, like, judging you, right? Like, the only time people judge you is when you're, like, lip-syncing to an actual MP3 and it's fairly obvious. So I wanted to actually hit, like, the opposite spectrum of that uh, whole kind of discussion. What if a band does really well live, but doesn't have money for ads and streaming? Is it just, like a game of like constant like content or is there other ways around it? The first thing I will always say when somebody mentions ads is nearly every band who's really breaking right now isn't paying a dollar for ads. I know Matt doesn't like that when I put, talk about this because he makes money on this, but <laughs> it's the real fact is every week I look at who's on the viral 50, who's on the things, most of the people don't spend one dollar on ads, so we can throw that right out. Love rarely, does that ring a bell, a math core band, anybody? I, okay. I know that is. Okay, so yeah, I just made a video on them. They are math core with screaming. They are getting hundreds of thousands of streams a month just by being repetitive and good at TikTok with like four things. They're not spending more than a few hours, but people really like what they do, so it's converting well. If you find, you know, like our friend Dustin has a saying that I don't totally agree with, that there's bands that have just not found their audience, I think there's a lot of truth to that, that a lot of people are toiling away in obscurity and going, no one likes me, I haven't found anything, when really they haven't put in like the 10 hours it takes to literally have your life turn around to find the people on the internet who are looking for you. I see it all the time with people I talk to is that when we finally find the people who are on the internet that would have liked them instead of where the algorithm was taking them, that their life totally changes and like that band, well, really, like, I think about it, like, the first time I heard it, I was like, I have been waiting for somebody to do polyphia, but instead of showing off fucking scales all day, but doing it fucking heavy, but clean, with really poppy vocals, and then I found them, because the algorithm found me. Largely, I agree, because, like, I think, I think there's definitely this piece of people kind of getting their heads, like, oh, you can only grow with ads, and it's like, well, no, because, first of all, if the music isn't really good it doesn't matter right because the whole point of ads is like you spend three hundred dollars you get a thousand people over to your spotify ideally those thousand people all listen to the song in full and spotify goes oh shit okay people really like this and the people who like this also seem to like these other artists let's go show it to them and then you got on spotify radio and the streams pop off and yada 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 cool okay but obviously if people are clicking the ad and then going to your song and being like nah this sucks and skipping then you're shit out of luck. Ads can't create, they can only amplify like what's already happening. You know what I mean? Like you can't be like, I'm never gonna post and I'm just gonna run ads and then I'm gonna get a million Spotify monthlies and it'll make the investment back. Like that's not how it works, right? That being said, if you have something that's working, if you have something where like, oh, the content is really good, oh, people connect, then the ads are like a really good amplification of that. And you do see a lot of people like once they hit using ads to pour fuel on the fire, but I definitely think like you need to have something that like people actually resonate with and just trying to like, like anything that's like a paid shortcut does not work because like, because ultimately like again, like it really boils down to like, do people fuck with the music? Yes or no? The other thing was yeah, the shortcut is that ads were shortcut at their dawn, but what I like to think of as these things exploits. So right now, like a lot of what I've been covering in my recent YouTube videos, one that's particularly going up tomorrow is there's exploits, things that have just started working that work really well for anybody and you're gonna get a little bit more. The exploit I like to point to the most is one that was admitted, which was um, 
Does anybody remember a band called from about yes. 15? Okay, horrible band. No one wanted this. No one wanted this. They admitted that they fully hacked their way through pure volume to being the most, before anybody knew what a fucking bot was, they figured out how to do it and they tricked all these bands into taking them on tour. People just sit there like, whoo, this sucks. And it was unbelievable. And then they went back after they broke up, did an interview with I remember I was, I, I used to work Can you fact check this one for us real quick? And I'm like, holy shit. These guys fully admitted they faked their way through it. There's lots of exploits that get you an audience without doing that. That was the worst of the era. But right now, the crazy thing is, is there is so many people who are looking for music who can't find what they want to hear quite yet. And the exploits really are that TikTok and Reels are unbelievably great at music discovery right now because everyone is addicted to doing this and not addicted to hitting play on a playlist. It has great a number. Yeah, the more, the more you show up, the more swings you take, the closer you get. It's really that simple. I have a question, like, I feel like we live in a time where it's like, like Jesse, I listen to a lot of your content, you talk about how it's best to release like every six to eight weeks, um, and do like this single thing as opposed to like more like EPs or albums, which seems to be like the general consensus, and I feel like, what would you recommend to an artist who feels like they like really prefer like a project by project basis in terms of songwriting and like each project is like a chance to evolve and like reinvent yourself and like shift your genre like but you want to stay like consistent out for the algorithm like what, what, what recommendation would you have? I guess my question is to artists who say that to me is always like well unless you're like writing an album like every every fucking month at which point you probably need to edit yourself. We all know that guy. <laughs> but like, unless you're writing an album every month, like, why not just slow roll it as you write the next one? With a band I manage, right? Like, we had a single drop in September, a single, or sorry, a single in October, a single in November, EP dropped in January. And while that was going on, they were finishing up the next album. And now the next album, first single drops May 2nd, singles every month up until it drops in October. So we're gonna have like, basically a year where there was some sort of music nine out of 12 months, right? But it was, but they're, they're a band who like want to do project by project things. But they're sort of treating the marketing process as one part of the business and the, and the creative process as another part of the business. And they don't have to be in tandem. Do you know what I mean? You can be like, hey, I'm going to roll this out over a year while simultaneously I'm touring and promoting, and then during that time I'm gonna, um, you know, write a new album and focus on that project. So two separate answers. As far as editing yourself goes, there is a reason that, why is there people in this business, you know, like, I don't really like to quote Rick Rubin ever since he went QAnon, but his process was always- That makes um, me want to quote him more. <laughs> <laughs> you write 20, Four songs, we're gonna record 18, you're gonna release 12. Black Sabbath, his favorite band of his childhood, comes to him and they go, yeah mate, we have 11 songs. He's like, great, you have a six song record. They're like, no, that ain't gonna work. He's like, I'll let you record eight. But the real reality is, the reason he does that is because the majority of artists don't go through enough development. We have more than enough music these days. Viper put out 345 albums in one year while he had a woman in his basement. <laughs> True story. And real fuck up, 343? I might need a fact check on the last number. It's 340-something. It's 100% it's real. He it kidnapped a woman in his basement the whole time. It's a horrible story. Point being, no one needs to hear all this music. We all get scared when we hear that there's 60,000 songs put up a day, whatever the latest number being period is. What we need is your best stuff. So. The idea that we need more of you, when really you probably need to develop some of these songs more, take some of the ideas, the verse from this one, turn it into a bridge for that one, that's probably a lot more likely than we need to hear everything you do. But when it comes to the albums and the singles, albums are great and they're a lot of what gets people to fall in love and build a deep relationship with you. But um, I always point to Panda Express uh, as the thing of this. Who here loves Panda Express? Okay, so the problem with Panda Express though is they are in a lot of places where people want to consume it for lunch and 
How do most of us feel after Chinese food for lunch? <laughs> Questionable. Hungry. Questionable at best. So what their solution to this was, was handing out a piece of chicken on a stick, because then it would go, fuck it, I'm gonna have the Panda Express. That tasted so fucking good. That is the same thing as singles and albums. You should have albums, you should have EPs, you should have things, but the only way you can get people into that is if you hand out the sample, because people are not gonna just go, fuck it, I'm eating Panda Express every day. Hey guys. Hi. How are you doing? Hell yeah. So, what would be the essentials for each one of you, or maybe if that exists? Because sometimes you think you're making it through, but maybe not. Or maybe you think like, okay, so to make it through, maybe you need just money, but that's not the answer. Or maybe just you just need uh, a good song or good music, but that's not the answer too. So what would be the essential for you, for each one of you? Maybe meeting the right person at the same time, or maybe struggling so hard, I don't know. Go with that. So I think there's a really interesting thing is that, I, you're asking a very good question, is that um, a lot of people, it's very easy for us to shit on labels because honestly, like I said before, a lot of fucking idiots like a lot of these labels. But the smartest people are very good at finding weak links in artists and finding where to do development. When we say artist development, what a lot of artist development often was, was saying, okay, what should we be focusing on most effectively? We can't be doing just this. A, a good example, I think of this all the time, is there's two roads to this, is um, Chapel Roan, who's one of the most viral artists in the world, was signed to Atlantic Records for the last six years. Who has ever heard of an artist that was able to stay on a label for six years and develop in this day and age? Very fucking rare, and now it's paying off and she has huge hits. A lot of us are like, oh, well, what if I had the right things? Then you have an opposite case. You have a Lady Gaga. First record, monumental, diamond record, very rare thing, especially in that era. And then the two biggest money losing records, uh, number two and number three biggest money losing records in the history of the music business, only up to Michael Jackson's last record, which will never get topped again because no one will ever give that money, much money to anybody again, will happen. You need to think about what is good about you, what you, how you take your resources, and what is weak about you, and constantly try to accent what's good and fix what's bad. And those are hard answers to do. Yeah, I also think a couple things. One is that because of the endowment effect, which is kind of this idea that you think something is good just because you did it, because, because you spent a lot of time on it moreover, you know, it's very easy to kind of think, oh, my music is amazing, everyone's fucking up by not like being in love with me, right? And I think that it takes, becoming really good at songwriting is like an iterative process, right? This is something Jesse talks about in his book, which you should buy, Processing Creativity. You know, so like, first of all, it takes a long time to get to a point where you're like, writing truly great songs. And the vast, vast majority of people never get to a point where they're writing truly great songs. You know, and you kind of need that to get anywhere in the first place. You know, and I think it's easy to hear that and be like, oh, well, fucking, this person writes really crappy songs and they're really popular. And it's like, yeah, but it's working for someone. You know what I mean? So I think like the truly great music is like really a, a fundamental part of it. The other piece, I think, and I'm surprised you didn't touch on this as much, is and this is another really key part of artist development, is the community building part. You know what I mean? Is this idea of like, the people who are really blowing up, like the guys who like, I met when I was 18, who or even, no, actually that's not true. The people I met when I was 15 who played Madison Square Garden a few weeks ago are just like the dudes in the community. Elder are like, going to shows, hanging out. Anytime I'm in Berlin, I bump into those guys like, not because I tried to text them, just because we're both wanted to see Steve Von Till. You know, because they're just in the community. They're jamming with people, they're figuring it out, they're growing, you know what I mean? And I think that's a really fundamental part that nobody wants to think about. Do you know what I mean? Is like, because that's the hard part. The hard part is like having truly amazing music and then being able to go out and connect with a bunch of people. But like, if you're not connecting with a bunch of people, what the fuck are you doing? And I just look at every artist I work with who's truly successful, my favorite thing is like talking to them and being like, oh my God, you're friends with this guy and you're friends with this guy and oh my God, we have all these mutuals because they did the community building and I did the community building. So if you're like a metal artist popping off, we're gonna know 
50 of the same people because we're just in the scene. Do you know what I mean? And I think that's a really huge piece that is underestimated. And something we try to kind of do with these meetups is kind of meeting other people who are like in the scene and actively doing the damn thing. Because the more people you meet who are doing the damn thing, the more people you can collaborate with, you can tour with, you can have mix your record, you can do a whatever the fuck. And that community building piece is crucial. And the really good A&Rs are connectors. They're the guys going, hey, why don't you meet this producer? Why don't you meet this other band and see what happens? You know what I mean? Like I had this thing for a really long time where I would introduce two people every day. And sometimes it would lead to nothing, but other times it would like I'd get a message like six months later and be like, you introduced me to this guy, and now I have a record deal. And it's like, because they had great music, and they were building community. Hi everyone, I'm Liv. My question is, for small artists, how important are cassettes, vinyl, and CD, both creation and sales? I literally wrote about this yesterday. I think there's an interesting thing, because every genre, this is a little different. Um, if you are making music for old people, CDs are gonna do very well and they're gonna look at you like, you're selling a fucking cassette? Even though they probably bought those cassettes uh, back in the day. But uh, I think that the big thing since, uh, I can tell this is not the demographic here tonight, cassettes are the best way to test if you should go further into vinyl. Does anybody know what uh, Presley is? Has anybody used this service yet? I've been dying to talk to somebody who's used it all. Presley is the first affordable quality vinyl pressing that's very easy to use that I've seen. Um, I tried some vinyl from it the other day. I am, I've worked on vinyl quality control for a decade. Is the first time I ever saw vinyl that was short run that I didn't want to throw it and break it in half. So my thing is now, is now we can test the market with cassettes and if it's going well, you can make vinyl. We've never had that before and that's fucking awesome. That's a really good point. I think the first thing to accept is that nobody like is really listening to music on a physical format. And the people who are listening to vinyl consistently are like gen usually the most annoying person you know. <laughs> and we all know that's true. <laughs> you know, so like you could just have to accept that like physical music is in 99% of cases a collector's item, which is fine. But that's what it is. It's a, it's, it's a collector's item. Cassettes are really cool because they're interesting and unique and different, but they're also cheap to make, and you can print 50 for, you know, $200 and be fine, and sell them for $10, $15, right? So figuring out a short run first initially is good. And also, like, CDs are, yeah, CDs are generally not it, unless, very specifically, you have a fan base who started buying records in the 90s. Like, I signed this band called November's Doom. Oh, fuck yes! Sorry. Thank you so much. <laughs> Max, what, what's with you working with, like, seasonal bands? Auto Kings, November's Doom? Like, what's when with we signed season? November's like Doom, finish? I was trying to sign October Falls at the same time. Oh, wow. Because I was like, man, it would be cool if I could sign all the month bands. <laughs> Sad Boy Metal Death right here. Hell yeah, brother. <laughs> um, yeah, you get it. But all this to say, like, November's Doom is a band who, like, really, like, came of age, like, 95 to 2004. And it was, like, the one record on the label I put them out on where we sold way more CDs than we sold LPs. Because it was just like, oh, those people started buying CDs, you know? So if you have, like, that specific fan base, yeah. But otherwise, and CDs do still sell surprisingly well. But again, in the context of a collector's item. And so I think you always have to ask yourself, with any physical you're doing, like, what is the value add? Like, so with, with LPs, anytime I do an LP, basically, I try to include a poster. Because it, it's like, it, it adds like a dollar to the cost per unit, but like, it makes it way cooler. And again, it's like, you are not creating, no one who buys your LP, no one who buys your cassette, whatever, is listening to it on a physical format more than one time. Unless it's their favorite record. And then they're gonna have 10 records in their life they actually listen to on physical. That's it. So you're creating a collector's item. That's important, but treat it like that. A, a story I tell a lot is, um, so I've mastered records and done a lot of vinyl over the years and now. One of the biggest artists I work with, like literally six million monthly listeners on Spotify type of thing. I get a frantic call from their manager. They go, we sent you the wrong labeled song and no one listened to the test press. And the wrong song is on the LP. And I went, 
wow, you guys are fucking idiots. And here's the fun thing. That vinyl, I think, has sold, I'm going to say at least five to 10,000 copies. They've never received a single email or no one has ever talked to them because this band's fan base is about 15 years old and no one listens to the fucking record and notices. No, this, this is it. Like, I'm like, as many of you know, I'm a huge music nerd. I own two LPs. A signed Agaloc record that was like dedicated to me. Hell yeah. And a first pressing screen bloody gore. Never played. I don't care. I have a multiple thousand dollar record player that looks like it's wired. I've never connected it. I've lived in my apartment for nine months. <laughs> yeah, this is what I'm saying. It's like, in my house, there is a multiple thousand dollar record collection, a very nice record player. We've used it like twice. <laughs> yeah, I'm on zero. Hello, my name is Rosa. I have seen both of you guys. I do have a question though. So I've seen your video about promoting your music, right? So I want to know, how do you promote your music like, how is the sequence? And this is a two-parter. Is it possible to promote a single and an album the same way? Or do you promote it differently? The core thing is going, I'm going to have a body of work. I'm going to release a single every six weeks. I'm going to sit down and figure out every piece of content I can create to promote that single for six weeks. Then I'm going to move on to the next one. And what I'm going to do to promote that single for six weeks is I might have my own ideas but I'm also going to go look at every artist I admire and just take all their ideas and just do that. All that to say, so I think like that's kind of the core loop is like consistent releases with a lot of content around each time, focusing on the hooks, focusing on the Jesse Cannon patented word, earworm era, and being like, okay, this is what I do that makes me special, high, leading into the brand, right? And I think that for 98% of artists, that is what it needs to be. Because like, until you're at a place where you have a bunch of strangers coming to your show, you know, like PR isn't gonna help you. Radio isn't gonna help you. That's not really how it works. Like the way, like the, the sort of order of operations is create great music, build a community around it, start to get some real organic interest, run some ads around it, keep building it, and then eventually, but well like you agree that ads come before PR. Uh, no, actually, I don't agree. You don't? Okay. No, 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 no. Why not? Why not hit me? In many genres, some genres, PR is useless altogether. If you are making really great content, PR is going to be worth more because PR will have an easy time landing that great content in more organic reach places in some genres, whereas I will agree that ads are a necessary thing, but ads are largely serving in most conversions, people have already heard about you in the best case. And if you only had a certain amount of money, but you had great content, I would choose ads. If your content was crap, I'm sorry, I, I would use, choose PR. But if you had mid content, I'd probably choose ads. That's fair. And that's why I do strategy for a living. Is that all that there we plus. go. But okay, yeah, second to, part to get to the second part of the question, promoting a single versus an album. To me, and I'd be curious for Jesse's thoughts, the way I view it is, you got your 10 song album or whatever, you're gonna do like half that album on singles, just putting it out, putting it out, putting it out, putting it out, because that's what's gonna grow the, like, because the way attention works is like, people only care about artists doing new things, right? Like, nobody cares about an artist who hasn't done something in two years. You know, it's a lot harder to get opportunities when you haven't done stuff in two years, you know what I mean? So like, you want to be able to take advantage of that album cycle and having all this material to kind of keep eyes on you for as long as possible, right? The core difference with promoting an album versus just singles you're putting out is at some point you have to go, what is the physical product? How do I highlight that physical product and keep people engaged on that, right? Because that's where you're gonna, you know, a single cassette sale if you're getting a $12 profit on that, that's worth, you know, what, like several thousand, 3,000 streams, I think. You know, so like that's when you kind of switch the dial and you start to go, okay, we're gonna have cassettes. We're gonna have t-shirts with the album art. We're gonna have CDs or whatever the fuck, eight tracks if you're really clever. And like, you go from there. You know what I mean? Yo, Chris, fuck you. Eight tracks are a great fucking... <laughs> Thank you, Chris. I love you. <laughs> but like, but like, you know, whatever your physical product is, 
um, you know, you have to really go like, okay, let's lean into that and let's make sure we're showcasing that and showcasing like, hey, this is a really great way to support me and a great way to have a, circling back, a collectible around the music. So I wrote a video this year where I, a lot of my videos on YouTube, I take notes for sometimes two years, most often six months to a year. Uh, I did one on this, that I'm not gonna say this is good, but the quick synopsis is, singles when done well leading into a record. Almost every campaign I see that really does a great job at getting a record to explode is basically saying, I have some sort of narrative. That narrative can be really shallow. Charlie XCX's narrative right now is, my last record sucked, let's party, this one's fucking dope, can't wait for you to see you at the club and all you dry humping each other. That's a fine narrative to do for her crowd, as fucking shallow as it is. The point being, then what happens when that album comes out though is, what are the experiences, what are the times, and what is the thing? If you think of it this way, what does any band do 10 years after their record? Somebody reposts, this was my wedding song, we fell in love with this. It's just what happened during the record. So, but that is really valuable because the thing is, is people are always looking for experiences. I think of all the time. I've had a really rough ride so far in 2024, finding like full length records I really love. 2023 was probably the least amount of them I ever found, whereas I loved so much music from 2023. So I'm very eager when somebody's like, this record's amazing. For example, Pitchfork gushed over this, uh, this record that's not even on Spotify, and of course it's two hours long, and everything. I listened through the fucking two hours because it's quite an experience. People tell me I'm not experienced, I'm gonna listen. A lot of the thing I think bands neglect about releasing a record is they forget to tell the experience and as stupid and as much as like that doesn't matter, it does not have to be a profound thing. If it is an extreme death metal, it can be like, I learned how to pick in a new fucking way. That is not profound shit here. Like, it can be, my record is fun. Tell some story, your audience is the type of person who will appreciate it. So I guess as an indie artist, I feel like, you know, we're working with small budgets, so it's hard to know like in which direction to throw that out outside of actually making the album, but like playlist pitching or like working with the PR or like doing the ads. And I do as much as I can that's free, but I guess like in your opinion, what's the best place to kind of throw that money? It's, it's different for every artist I know. And then this is just something that I'm confused about, but um, for the playlist, they say that you're not supposed to be paying for them, but then you shoot an email and they're like, yeah, I want your song on it, but it costs such and such amount. So what's the, what's the vibes? <laughs> Second part of your question. Three biggest waste of money that artists do. One is definitely like paying to be on a bunch of different playlists. There's a very real like cottage industry of that. And in the vast majority of cases, it's just like a dramatic waste of time. Because first of all, if you're not on like the exact right playlist, that's gonna up your skip rate. And like, that's what fucking kills you. Because if your skip rate is high, then it just doesn't matter. Because you're not, because like the artists who like you see where like maybe they're not huge but they have 200k Spotify monthlies and like are getting like a big boy check every month. Like they just hit Spotify radio because they wrote really good songs that didn't have any skips. Algorithmic, Spotify algorithmic playlist. Yeah, Spotify algorithmic, or whatever, right? Well like Autumn Kings is like, large days. anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, all this to say like you, like the way you make money is algorithmic playlists, right? And if you have a high skip rate, then you're just fucked. And paying to be on a lot of these playlists is gonna increase your skip rate and it's gonna fuck you. So right, just, let, me, let me put an asterisk. Paying to be on is different from paying for consideration. Submit Hub is consideration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Be on is bad, and all those playlists are only worthless. No yeah, need for very, very crucial distinction. Thank you, Jesse. Yes. The second place I see a lot of people wasting money, we talked about this a little bit earlier, is um, radio, because radio is like a lot, a lot of money, and if you're not like already getting traction in other places, then like, yeah, you're gonna end up spending like five, $6,000 to kind of screw yourself. Similarly, PR, again, if you're not like having people organically check you out who you do not know en masse, where you think some random person who was sent a pitch about you would be like, oh yeah, I know that band, I'll write about them, then you're really screwing yourself. And also- I, Let me sidebar that, I don't agree with that. 
if you have extraordinary content, yeah, 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 yeah. you can come out of no place with PR yeah, yeah, yeah. and have it be worth it. My thing is always this, is that if you need to pay to make that extraordinary content, now most people who are making really extraordinary content these days are doing it on a very limited budget and doing it, there's a performer named Hemlock Springs. She just gets all her weird friends together and does really cool shit and does that. Then the publicist can get that more attention. But in other cases, then what Matt was saying. Absolutely. Correct. And then I'll add a bonus one. I think that a lot of people are wasting money on ads because they don't have anything to back it up. Yeah. Right? Because it's like, oh, I put out this song and I have crappy content I'm trying to promote with, which doesn't help you. And then also, you go check out their Insta like they're, they spend $3,000 on ads. And then you go check out their Instagram and it's just like crappy posts. So it's like there's nothing for the fan to latch on to. Like you need to have, if you're gonna promote using ads, that can work, but you need to have substance. You know what I mean? So that's where people are wasting their money. Just he's gonna tell you where to spend your money. That's where I was gonna go. I appreciate you reading my mind. Yes, okay, so you're an indie artist. Here's some ways you can spend money. One of the things that gets a lot of doors open is um, a beautiful thing these days is that there is now so many people with so many credits that are great credits that you can work with that will one, make your music better. So we all know people listen to music more when it's done better. So getting a good producer, getting a good mixer, a lot of people think that's gonna be a lot of money. I'm a retired record producer, mixer and mastering engineer. I have a million friends who are sitting, who are very talented, who are not employed as much as they would like. Many of the top mixers, my favorite mixer told me he mixes six songs a day which is unfucking believable when you hear the quality of his work. But the fact is, everybody's gotten it good, they've gotten assistants who do these things. So if that person is not getting, let's count it, a thousand songs a fucking year, he's underemployed, so he's willing to cut deals here and there to get to it, especially when it's really good. So the other thing is, with that, when you tag that person on Instagram, and you're able to say that thing, you're able to one, get doors broken down when your playlist pitching, two, when they reshare it, it goes to all their manager friends who work with them, and if they hear it, well, that kind of slaps. They see the name, they know, da 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 does great work. That can be a very easy ticket into things. The second way I think that people really can do this is paying somebody who really gets TikTok in your local area. We're all obviously in a more metropolis area here since we made it here tonight, but for a lot of people, Sometimes paying the local person who takes pictures of their fucking muscles or ass really can teach you a lot. And I've had a lot of people I consult with have major breakthroughs going, can I pay you $300 for one day to follow you around and listen to you, show me every question I have. I'm gonna annoy the shit out of you, but you're gonna be $300 richer. Honestly, has turned around a few people I've worked with. And then third, really at the end of the day, I think that the re real thing is a softbox like dome, a better iPhone and um, some sort of colored, either colored filter or film filter for your editing where you can consistently make content yourself that feels like your music. 100%, and I think just to circle back to your second point about like finding the local like TikTok celebrity to like help you out, like this is where the community building piece comes in. I've literally seen artists like go on tour with uh, this band I manage, Escuela Grind, who are like incredible at Instagram. And then like finish, like start the tour and then finish the tour better at making content because they just hung out with Escuela and who are just the best at Instagram. And it was just like, oh, okay, like this is what they do. And they were nice to me. And blah, blah, blah. Like that's where the community building comes in. Kara has a question. Hello, everyone. You look beautiful from up here. Uh, my name is Kara Kozer. That's Kozer, uh, like the word loser, but it's spelled with a K. Um, so, okay. Here is where I'm at. Not really a deep question, but so I love making content. I love it. Uh, I feel like I'm not, I don't do terrible with editing. I churn out TikToks all the time. The TikToks that I create that don't really, like the junk ones that like people just think are funny, go viral. The stuff that I put out about my band, 500 views. I, I'm like trying to figure out how to make this like thing I got going on work for me as far as like my band is concerned. Sometimes I will put my band's tracks in the backgrounds of these like junk videos, but like nothing is really sticking. So I'm just wondering if you had feedback on like how I could capitalize on that. So 
there's in any era of music I've worked in in the last 25 plus years, there's always usually two things you can point to that somebody with no fans and the people at the top have a problem with. Right now, both those problems are exactly what you said, and that's all the streaming companies pay like shit. Everybody will say that across the board. So the thing being, when you have, you know, one of my consulting clients with 16 million monthly listeners, they have the same exact problems. They go, it does not get, and the key always is, is how do you bridge the two together as much as possible. So a good example is sometimes it really is just the thing of, in the middle of the video, I see it all the time. Like one of the funniest things about music marketing, when you really want to study it being done at a high level, find the prettiest man alive who listens to consultants all day long because they know they're a fucking idiot. All the pretty guys who make terrible pop punk with Travis Barker, the best marketer you'll ever see. What they do in all their videos, they're like, yo, look at me, I'm on the skateboard. You sing loud now. Da da da, back to the skateboard. Dropping it in and finding any way you can do it, whether it's dropping in the song, is kind of the only way we have right now. And really, the reality is what everybody's getting hip to is like, tour date announcement, you go, we have a new tour. That is gonna get one one hundredth of your best posts. But if you literally just put the tour dates going across and say, I was eating at an out burger. I can't wait to do that on tour tomorrow. Tour date's here. That will totally be a different thing. It's integrating it into the middle of it is kind of the only solution. Yeah, and this is something I've talked about a lot is like, because you're right, but I think if you sit down and you go, okay, consuming content thoughtfully from some of your favorite artists and being like, like the same way, like Jesse and I had this weird bonding early when we met about like our parents would like make us watch commercials and be like, how do they sell something to you? Because Jesse and I both might've been raised in a cult. <laughs> <laughs> but all this to say, like you can see the commercials that your favorite artists are making. You know what I mean? So like go look at them and be like, huh, how do they slip in a reference to their new record or their new whatever, or an old song they wanted to just push the catalog on, you know? And the two best artists on TikTok for this, in my opinion, are totally different ends of the spectrum. It's Papa Roach, shout out to Kobe, my man. Very good. Amazing. Um, Mr. Dick, if you're nasty. He was very nice to me when we hung out. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying. It's if they're nasty, not and, you. And then the other one was um, Apes of State. Are like the other, like they're like the best from like the DIY side, where if like you're like a kid who like hangs out at punk houses, like Apes of State like are the best at TikTok content. And just like looking at those two artists, but really any artist you like who is consistent on TikTok, and then just really asking yourself every time, how do they sell something in this video? Because, or, or how do they build brand in this video that tied into whatever they're doing? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And like, it's really like that intentional consumption. Like, that's how I got a lot better at TikTok with stuff I do. Um, you know, that's how Jesse got better at short form by stealing from me. <laughs> and. <laughs> I'm so uh -huh, glad I got that uh -huh. in. <laughs> but no, but like for real, like really like looking at other people very intentionally and being like, okay, what did they do to do this, you know? And that's a, that, that is genuinely a strategy Jesse and I both did use to get better at short form. And I was just being mean. Yeah, I, I think actually the best thing too is really to remember that you can make another TikTok account where you can just hit not interested on anything that's not a musician, because honestly, all the people I know who are best at TikTok are stealing from like country when they make metal or you know, they make queer hyper pop and they're stealing some fucking weird country racist or whatever. Like you're stealing from people who would never see your thing and figure out how you put your own flip on it. And like honestly too, it's like the number one I things I tend to steal for, I my fun fact day job is in politics. I steal from a lot of political people on how to do marketing and then I when I do Political consulting, everyone thinks I'm so cool because I'm like, well, this is how musicians do. They're like, musicians, we're fucking dorks, we're in politics. So it works all go. the ways, taking it from somewhere where you're not, but make your make a view only TikTok and just comment and click hard things all day. No one knows it's you and you will have inspiration for days. I literally, that's what I do to study all night. My name is Desi Santiago. I'm in a band called Modern Natives. My question is something that bothers me a lot. What happens when it's one or two members of a five-piece band that does all the work? Savannah back there booked the tour from Florida to Alaska two years in a row. 
But the other three guys, drunk and just perform drunk. Do I say, fuck it, we're two-piece, or do we just roll with the punches? Okay, so this is a really funny thing. So I was talking about when I used to work at Alternative Press. So when you are a writer for a column and you're a columnist, what you have to do is you have to say to somebody who usually hates their job, I have a great idea, will you let me do this? And a lot of the time your best ideas get left on the floor. So here was what I was gonna do, is I was gonna ask a hundred bands, how many members of your band do all the work and what percentages do you think they're done in? Because I know from managing bands and producing bands that your situation is almost every band. That's the real reality, is if you surveyed everybody in theirs. I get your anger, because you're totally right, because guess what, I know it well, because I was that person in my bands. But the real thing I've learned over the years is that you kind of suck it up and you do it. And one of the more interesting things is, um, we all, maybe not we all, many people look at Nirvana and they're like, oh, it was so nice, they eschewed everything. Well, Kurt Cobain at one point said, you fucking two don't do shit, I do it all. I'm taking away your royalties. Now another thing, I worked with The Cure a lot. Robert Smith does not give a fuck about money and he just doesn't want any problems. So you know what he does? Even though he does everything, he pays everyone exactly equally, even on the songwriting. I was in the studio, made a record with The Cure. They don't do anywhere near what he does. A lot of the time, this is just a value judgment about what you want your life to be. If you think you can get better, it's the kind of the same as dating. You just kick them to the curb and you try again. If you don't, sometimes you grin and bear it and go, fuck it, it's never gonna be even. Yeah, basically. I, I make this, uh, this video like once a month where it's basically just like, yeah, like look, this is how it is for bands. And you have to either accept like, if I treat everyone as an equal member, then essentially they're just session musicians and they're being paid to show up. You know what I mean? Because guess what? Finding people who show up is real fucking hard. You know, th this is the trade-off, is they are getting paid to show up and play music and play music correctly. You are getting paid to share your music with the world and cut through the noise and share your emotions with the world and all that good stuff. Think about what you would want to go and play some other motherfucker's music wherever and be tired and grouchy all the time. Like, I don't know, like, I've had that opportunity a bunch of times in my life and I was like, nah, you know, because <laughs> I'm lazy and I like being in Brooklyn. Like, why do you trouble so much? Then? <laughs> because when God brings good black metal to Brooklyn, I won't have to travel as much. But if but somebody needs to knit that for over your door, <laughs> I'll, I'll finish with what it says on my door. I'd be curious to see who gets it. But all this to say, that's the game. Is like, if you can find guys who show up consistently, you're already so far ahead of so many other creators trying to put their music in the world. And you just kind of got to be grateful for that, you know? And then you kind of have to be like, okay, are their personal personalities and substance abuse issues something you can manage? Yes or no? Because again, they're playing, like Eric said, they're playing your music, figure it out. You know what I mean? And what I will finish with before we wrap this all up is actually, Jesse, what it says on my door is a combination of a Pride and Prejudice quote and a Swans reference. Mine says, uh, always horny, never thirsty. <laughs> 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 <laughs>